With a view to God's blessing, then let's turn again to Luke chapter 13. That's page 1201, Luke chapter 13. And reading again at verse 1. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So these words, which are given in verse 3 and repeated in verse 5, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, the general theme that dominates this passage from the middle of chapter 12 onwards the general theme that dominates is the judgment of God, a very solemn theme, one perhaps that people think far too little about. And as Christ speaks about it, the people take the opportunity to ask him about two local tragedies or accidents that have taken place just in very recent days. One of them is an accident, the other is really a crime. And you have them recorded in verses 1 to 5. Now, when things like that happen, it's understandable that they're very heavy on people's minds. The same will be true of ourselves. You can see how much it's dominated our own city. Yesterday and the night before, when the helicopter came down on the public house, when these things happen, people think a lot about them, and people speak a lot about them. And, of course, a special set of questions begin to arise in people's minds. And however much people put God out of their reckoning, it's amazing how God seems to come back when a thing like this happens, because all of a sudden people expect God uh, either to have intervened or to intervene in a special way now. So people will ask things like, well, why did God uh, command this to happen? Or why did God permit this to happen? And people may go on and say, well, if God has commanded it or permitted it, why does he do it? Why does he, why does he do it? Does he do it for us? Is he communicating with us? Is there some kind of message for me? Or is there some kind of message to the city in what God, in what God has allowed and the people were essentially thinking exactly the same kinds of things, you see, when these two incidents took place in Jerusalem. Uh, let's look at the two incidents very briefly. There's first of all an incident that involved human evil. And that's when, as we have it recorded in verse 1, Pilate mingled the blood of some Galileans with their sacrifice. Now that's a uh, a very graphic and maybe a little bit of an obscure way to describe it. We'll see why exactly it's written like that in a minute. But what it's actually referring to is an incident that took place while Pilate was the governor of Judea. It's not recorded in the Bible, this incident. It's actually recorded in secular history. What happened was that there were rumors of unrest in Jerusalem. And I've said to you several times that the Roman authorities were very wary of Judea. It was a difficult province. There was a strong movement for independence all the time. And when they used to gather three times a year at their worship festivals, there was real concern that there would be some kind of attempt uh, to overthrow the Roman rule. So there were rumors of unrest, and Pilate decided to stamp his authority very firmly upon the province. He had only fairly recently come into it. So what he did was he got some of his uh, best soldiers and he gave them instructions to mingle with the crowd. 
with knives under their cloaks. And when they came to people who they knew were ringleaders of this kind of independence movement, simply to knife them in the crowd and move silently on. And there were several prominent Galileans killed like that by these covert Roman soldiers. This made Pilate's name really obnoxious to the Jewish people. It's also, it also actually didn't win him any favors with the Caesar in Rome. And it's one reason why Pilate later at Christ's trial was so weak, because he was afraid that he would fall foul of Caesar again. But the point is that that's how he dealt with this. And it caused many people to ask questions. Well, here are people coming to worship God in the temple, and some of them possibly innocently are just killed like that in the very act of offering worship uh, or being about to offer worship. That's why it's put that way, you see, that Pilate mingled their blood with their sacrifice. Pilate, of course, didn't stand and do that. But what, in effect, he did was shed the blood of those who are going to shed blood, the blood of animals in sacrifice in the service of God. So you can understand all the questions. In other words, it's not just simply a a tragic event. It's almost a a tragic event that involves um, the visible church in a special way. In other words, perhaps you could put it like this. It's not as though a building, let's say, was suddenly destroyed but let's say a building was destroyed by fire when there were worshippers inside it. You see the extra questions that that would raise. Well, why would God permit a church to go on fire and permit a church to go on fire when there were worshippers inside it? You can understand the kinds of questions. Why did God allow it? Or where was God, which is people's favorite question when such a thing happens? The second incident doesn't have human evil involved in it at all. It's just what we call in life an accident. An accident, just something that happens. The Tower of Siloam, which was quite near the temple, it fell suddenly and it killed 18 people. And these would have been random people, possibly people just passing by. And so the question again, where was God? Or why did these people die? People ask these things when they feel the pain and when they see the distress. Now, before I look with you at what Christ says here, I want you to notice just how hypocritical this question often is in the way that it's asked. Now, the question can be asked lawfully and rightly. That's why Christ deals with it. But it's often asked in a very hypocritical way. Uh, That came home to me very recently in... I think it was the most recent shooting in a school in America, and the usual questions were asked about where was God. And then this particular commentator on a TV station there said, well, why should we ask where God is, he says, when we've been systematically putting him out of schools for hundreds of years? It was a very good question, a very good observation, a very good comment. Because the fact is that since the Declaration of Independence in America, people have not wanted God in school at all. If you mention his commandments, you're not allowed to. If you mention his name, you're not allowed to. God is kept out of the school. And then when carnage comes, when death comes, and when evil comes, people turn around and say, well, where were you? And why didn't you intervene? Is it not quite lawful for God simply to say, well, you don't want me anyway, do you? You don't want my name, you don't want my law, you don't want my word, you don't want my presence, you don't want my commandments. So why shake your fist when things go wrong? It's a very good question. And that's what I mean by the hypocritical way in which we can sometimes ask this. You can do it yourself. Maybe you do do it. Maybe things have gone wrong for yourself in your life. And you're turning around and you're saying, well, why have you allowed this? And why is my life like that? And maybe God is telling yourself that you have been systematically excluding God from your own life in your own quiet way for the last two, five, or ten years. And really God is saying to you essentially, well, you have some kind of cheek to ask where I was when you don't stop to ask where I am in the good times. I'm there to blame when everything goes pear-shaped, but I'm never there to thank 
when everything is going well? And is that the way it is for yourself with God? Is that the way it is in connection with so many people involved with this tragedy? Yes, where's God? But where was God five minutes before the helicopter crashed? Was he welcome in the building? It's an important question. But still, still it is real. Where is God? What is he doing? Why does he permit it? What is he saying? What is he communicating to us when something happens like this locally? Well, what does Christ say? Well, the first thing we can conclude from what he says is this, that the people who asked the question were themselves concluding that the people who suffered must have been greater sinners than everybody else. They were essentially saying, well, these people who were randomly killed in the temple, some of them perhaps by accident, they died because God was somehow judging them. And these people who were in the vicinity of the Tower of Siloam when it fell, they died suddenly without warning, without a deathbed, without preparation, because God was bringing his heavy hand of judgment down upon them. In other words, they've done something to deserve it, and it's God's judgment on their lives. Now, the idea that you can always read God's judgment in people's lives is an old idea. You often see it in the Bible, and it's a persistent idea. It's a stubborn idea. I frequently meet people who say to me that such and such came into such and such as life because they had done such and such a thing. And I can't see any obvious or immediate connection between what happened to them and what they uh, supposedly had done. But this person is quite sure, you see, that it happened because the person perhaps wanted a thing to happen and waited until some calamity came, as calamities eventually do sometimes, and say, well, there it is, there's the calamity, and that's why the calamity came. And um, you see it in the Bible. It's not that long since we saw it in connection with Job. Job's friends erred like this. That's what's wrong with them. At the end of the book, God says to Job that his friends didn't speak well of himself, as Job had done. Job had maintained the righteousness of God, you see. But his friends who tried to protect God's righteousness actually got it wrong, They got it wrong because their basic philosophy was that if a terrible catastrophe comes into somebody's life, it's a sign of God's judgment. It is always a sign of God's judgment. And in connection with Job, his friends had come to the conclusion that he had sinned so grievously that God had to deal with him like that. He had to take away his family, he had to take away his possessions, he had to afflict him with an illness from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Job, they say, This has happened because you've done wrong. Now, of course, you're familiar with the fact that Job came out and said, well, I haven't actually done wrong. But you see, for his friends, that was the tin hat on it, because they then said, well, not only have you done wrong, but you can't even repent, and you can't even acknowledge what you've done wrong. And so they concluded that Job was not a true believer. He was not a true believer. And they began to speculate as to what kind of sin he had committed. (laughs) You notice what's happening. They're actually inventing a life for Job that he must have had before the catastrophe because there's no other explanation for the catastrophe. So they're inventing a new life. There are certain sins, they said, that you have committed. And that's the reason why you're suffering like this. That's because they have this idea in their heads, you see, that catastrophe means the judgment of God. You remember when our Lord was passing a man who was blind from his birth? The disciples asked a question, and it's quite a strange question. Who sinned, they said, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, it's a strange question because it's hard to see how the man himself could be guilty of it. Who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? They they must be kind of reaching out and saying, well, God must be foreseeing some kind of evil in this man's life, and to forestall it, he makes him born blind. That's how they're reasoning, or they're trying to reason it. And Jesus answers, neither, he says, neither. This man wasn't born blind because of his own sin. 
Neither was he born blind because his parents sinned. Neither. But that the work of God may be manifest in him. That's a glorious answer, that. That the work of God may be manifest in him. In what sense does the Savior mean that? Well, I think he means it in the sense that in God's provision, it was to fall to this man to be healed by our Lord Jesus Christ with the clay and with the spittle. Um, That's why he was born like that. And Christ is telling us in that that there's always a reason for whatever God does. Even the black works, the negative things, the hard things, and the painful things. It's a distress. You see, when a child is born blind, it was a distress to his parents. It was no doubt a distress to himself at many points in his life. But you see, the day was going to come when Jesus of Nazareth was going to pass by and open the eyes of this man for his own salvation, doubtless for the salvation of his family and for the salvation of others too, and God knows that. And it's, it's always our duty just to accept, to recognize that the just, the God of all the earth, the judge of all the earth, does right all the time. He has his purpose that he's bringing to pass and he brings good out of evil. We have an incredible ability to bring evil out of good, but God alone can bring good out of evil. And you can be sure, when anything comes into your portion and into your life that is hard, God will use it for his own glory and for your own spiritual welfare too. You've got got to hold on to that. You've You've got to believe that in the teeth of the storm. And when all around you is dark, you've got to believe that God will do good with it. You just need to lay hold on himself, and he will certainly turn it to the good. So, who sinned, him or his parents, Jesus says, neither. It's not a judgment. It is not a judgment directly related to these people's sins. So, what does Christ say about it then? Well, he says two things. First of all, a tragic end uh, doesn't mean that a person, or a tragic event, doesn't mean that a person has done wrong. You, you can never argue like that. You can never judge a person like that. Now, you've got to be careful in saying that because there are certain events in which you're to trace the judgment of God. And in fact, uh, Christ even rebukes the people here for their lack of spiritual discernment. He says, when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot weather. And he says, when you see a cloud rising out of the west, you say, well, there's a shower coming. And he says, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but you don't discern this time. You'll remember the children of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, were commended because they understood the times. They were men of discernment. And there's no doubt that God would have us all be in a spiritual condition where where we broadly recognized, you see, what he was doing in the world that we would recognize his hand and indeed when his judgments are abroad in the earth. There are times when we're supposed to read them and to read them carefully. But there's no doubt that when there's a specific judgment on a specific person, God makes it plain and he also stamps it with a certain kind of appropriateness. It's plain, it's easy to read, and there's an appropriateness about it. Let me give you a couple of examples um, The Lord, first of all, famously said, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Uh, When certain people who love violence and evil and plotting meet a a violent and plotting and evil end, there's a a judgment and a just desert in that. Haman is a great example of that in the book of Esther. Haman uh, spent his energy and his time trying to bring, bring down Mordecai, the man of God. And he thought he had engineered circumstances in a way to bring him down. And, of course, he built Mordecai's gallows very high to hang him on. And he was quite sure that just in a very short time, Mordecai was going to be publicly hanged and publicly disgraced. But, of course, events turned. Events turned as as they turn. The king, you'll remember, one night couldn't sleep. He asked for the public records to be brought. 
And when he read the public records there in his bed, he came across an incident involving Mordecai where Mordecai had never been rewarded and so on. And so events turned. And before you know where you are, Haman is actually hanged high on the gallows. Now, um, when you see Haman hanging high on the gallows that he had organized to be built for Mordecai, you're a pretty... Um, spiritually undiscerning person if you just walk past and say well isn't it strange you know there he is hanging there when he had built that for somebody else but that's just the way things go it's not the way things go it's not the way things go that is God very definitely bringing a judgment on a man who was bringing that precise judgment on somebody else and these are things we see and these are things we meant to see we behold it and we observe it And if you're close to the Lord, you do see it. People who behave in a certain way and they make the snares with which they themselves are caught. Psalm 7 or Psalm 9, I can't remember, 7 or 9. They make the snares with which they themselves are caught. And when you see that happen, we're warranted. We're warranted to recognize it as the hand of the Lord. But that doesn't mean that every time a catastrophe comes, you argue back and say, well, that person deserved it, or it came upon him because he's a particular sinner, or whatever. And that would be true in connection with the people who were in that public house on Friday night. Were they worse sinners than all the other hundreds and thousands who were in public houses all over Glasgow on Friday night? No. No. They weren't chosen because of their particular evil, or that house because of its particular evil. We're not meant to conclude it like that. So that's the first thing the Lord says. He warns us against these snap judgments. But I want you to notice that Christ doesn't leave it at that. He tells us twice in verse 3 and verse 5, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Where they were sinners, I tell you no, he says, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, the, the strange thing is that this particular verse is very often just ignored or misunderstood when people deal with this passage, as though Christ had never said it. In fact, you would think that Christ had only answered the first part of verse 3, I tell you no, as though he never went on to say this part, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. But these are scorching words. They're very searching words. They're powerful words. I tell you no, but unless you repent, all of you, all of you will similarly perish. You will perish in a similar way. Now, I want you to notice what Christ is not saying. He's not simply saying that all of us are going to die one day. That is true. Probably, unless he returns again, of course. So that is true. But that's true whether we repent or not. You notice that what Christ says here is that unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. But the fact that we're going to die is true of us all anyway. It's got nothing to do with our repentance. We will die. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. That's a fact of life. For you and for me, we're going to die. And neither is Christ saying that if you don't repent, you will die in an accident or you will die like this. He's not saying that either because that's not true either. There are many people who don't repent. They stay in their sins and they have a deathbed and they have a quiet deathbed. And they seem to have, from one perspective anyway, a peaceful deathbed. Depends, of course, what you mean by a peaceful deathbed. I don't know what you think a peaceful deathbed is. I think I may have shared with you before someone I saw a long, long time ago in another congregation in a hospital bed and uh, tried to speak with him. I knew his situation was terminal, and he knew his situation was terminal himself too. And he was reading a, uh, a newspaper. He was reading the Sun newspaper, And I tried to talk to him just about one or two spiritual things. And he lifted up the paper and said that this was all he needed. This was all he needed. And he was quite happy with that. And in a way, you know, he seemed happy enough. Uh, 
He wasn't too bothered. He was going to die. That was that. And he had his son newspaper. So in a way, I suppose, he was peaceful enough. But it's a strange kind of peace. A strange kind of peace, that. Would have done him good just to take a look beyond the precipice. Would have, take, would have done him a lot of good to have opened the pages of the Scripture just to hear what God has to say. Because he doesn't just say it is appointed for men once to die, but after that, the judgment. Once to die, after that, the judgment. So it's a peace, yes, but it's a false peace. It's an absurd peace. It's a stupid peace to have, to be just going into eternity without a thought as to what might lie beyond So there's many a person who doesn't repent and who doesn't die in an accident. They die quite peacefully on their deathbeds. So what does the Lord mean then? Well, what he means very simply is this, that these sudden tragedies are just pictures for us, parables almost, of the coming judgment of God, which will be sudden when it comes and which will be final when it comes as well. And instead of trying to assess the spiritual condition of those who died in these accidents, you're to let these solemn events remind you of something else. You're to let them point you to the the catastrophic event that is going to bring so many people's life to a close. You're to let them point you to the final judgment of God. And in that way, it's meant to function as a spiritual lesson to yourself. It's a spiritual lesson to yourself. And if you're in your place, that's how you take it. I'm not saying by that that you don't wonder what the spiritual condition was of the people who died. Yes, we do. And it's right to do. It's right to be shaken by that. It's right to tremble at that thought. To think of people just doing something one minute and the next something, it's gone. Next moment, it's gone. It's finished. It's all over. It's right to step back and say, well, how was it with them? How was it with their souls? It's right to answer it. Didn't Job himself wonder at that very thing when his family were all feasting? They were feasting together, his sons and his daughters. And that terrible wind blew and the building fell and they were all killed. His whole family were killed in one fell swoop. And what we had been told just a few verses earlier that whenever they gathered like that, he prayed especially for them, that there would be no evil in their hearts and that there would be no foolishness in their gathering, no emptiness or vanity or irreligion. He, he prayed especially like that when they gathered like that. Even he was afraid of that. How much more we should be afraid of it. When a blow like that falls, what were they thinking? What were they doing? Did they have a thought of God? Did they have a thought of their soul? Did they have a thought of eternity? And amongst all that happens, that is seldom thought of or seldom discussed. So it's right to wonder that. And it's also right to say, well, if such a thing came to me right now, how would it find me? How would it find me? Um, If something were to fall on this building, just like that, how would it find you? The text that came into my own head when I first heard of it, straight into my own head, was one from the passage I read to you at the beginning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And it's where Paul is speaking about the coming judgment of God. It's on page 1358. It's as well for you actually just to turn to it for a moment or two. Page 1358. And um, as I mentioned before the reading, Paul tells them at the end of chapter 4 that those who have fallen asleep in Christ in verse 13 In other words, those who have died, you'll remember that falling asleep is a a way that the New Testament writer speaks of the Christian's death. Um, 
they fall asleep. That, that presents a picture of the body resting. Um, even, if it's, even if it's decaying in the ground, the word sleep conveys the fact that it's resting there. It's in peace because Christ has a hold of it and Christ will one day renew it and regenerate it. Those who have fallen asleep, verse 13, I'm in here. Too. This is First Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, resting in him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So those who have died will have a kind of priority because what happens in verse 16 is this, that the Lord himself will descend. This is the second coming from heaven. He will descend with a shout, so it's an audible thing, with the voice of an archangel. There's an announcement made of the second coming and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So... When this event happens, we are still alive, but suddenly in the graves there is a resurrection. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. I think he's writing to Christians here, you see, who expected the second coming of the Lord very, very soon. And they're confused when fellow Christians are dying. Uh, The time is dragging out, but Paul's correcting these things. He says, uh, death is going to happen, but it's going to result in a glorious resurrection. So comfort each other. But then he moves on in chapter 5, and he says, Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now, this is the text that I must say just flashed through my mind when I heard of it. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. When they say peace and safety, that doesn't mean, of course, that they're actually going around saying peace and safety. It just means that this is what they feel. They have a sense of security, a sense of um, indestructibility, they're, um, they're so strong and so powerful. And people say that young people often feel like that, and um, that may well be true, but sometimes in, when you're young, there's a certain kind of vulnerability too, a certain kind of uh, tenderness like that. But at the same time, there's a kind of idea like, well, it's not going to be you, and you're immune, and uh, your life is still long and is stretched out before you, and there's this kind of idea of being almost indestructible, peace and safety, security. There was that in these walls, security. Then, he says, sudden destruction. Sudden destruction, just like a thief in the night. And it is the suddenness. Um, It's also unexpected, isn't it? I mean, you're one moment in that building, enjoying yourself in whatever kind of way you are enjoying yourself, and then suddenly, suddenly, the destruction just comes like that. And so often in in our lives, the judgment of God comes like that. Our death comes like that, which is a judgment call, is it not? Death is a judgment call in the sense that it's the judge of all the earth coming down and saying, time up and moving you out. Um, It's not judging you for that event at that time on that day, but it's the judgment call upon your whole life. I mean, God brings the curtain down and he brings it all to a close and he says, that's it. And he brings you up and he brings you into his own presence. It's sudden. And I suppose even if you were going to say, well, what if you have a deathbed? Yes, but still, still, there's a suddenness about it. And there's a swiftness about it. Like a thief in the night. So quick. So quick. Events like this are quick. Our death, when it comes, even when it's drawn out, is still quick when it happens. It's sudden. Is that it? Is that the last breath? Has it just gone? Has the person gone? Is that it? Is it over? And the judgment of God 
when the second coming comes is certainly like that. There's a sudden announcement. There's a sudden shout. There's a blow of the trumpet. And he is visibly seen from one pole of the earth to the other. And he comes with the myriads of his angels and of his saints. And as the book makes plain, two people are grinding. One is taken and another is left. Two sleeping in a bed, one is taken and another is left. It's the suddenness. It's the swiftness. No one expected it. No one thought it was coming. But it's come and it's happened. And it's real. It's real. Psalm 73, which we sang, How are they brought into desolation in a moment? In a moment, he says, brought to desolation. And, of course, there's the finality of it all, too. It's a destruction. Sudden destruction comes upon them. Um, You see a building like that one minute. It looks good, and it's lit, it's illuminated, and it's full of music, and it's full of laughter. Next minute, it's a smoking ruin. It's carnage, wreckage, charred metal, smoke, an acrid smell. There's, there's the difference between what it was a minute ago and what it is now. And people will always say, well, it was like a movie, you know. It was like something out of a movie. The amount of times I hear that, when something like this happens, it was like something out of a movie. The problem is, it's not like something out of a movie. And I'll tell you why it's not like, like something out of a movie. Because the people who are lying there don't just get up and take the makeup off and start walking again. Because they're dead and it's over. And that's not like it is in the movies. I'm conscious because, because of our, our movie permeated world and because of the amount of visual images that we have all the time like that, there's, there's a blurring. Everything is becoming more real. There's a, there's a new virtual reality. Put some glasses on, some controls in your hand, and you're there. And the difference between there and actually being there seems so small. But what a big difference it is at the end of the day. They're dead, and they're gone, and it's finished. And they don't just stand up and walk again. And, and what it's called here is sudden destruction comes upon them. Sudden destruction. Or as Jesus says, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. This word in the Greek, apolumai, perish, which means, what does it mean to perish? It means to become completely useless. That's what the word actually means, to become completely useless. One of the best illustrations of it is when the Lord refers to the wineskins, that were used to, to, to hold the wine. He says, you don't put new wine into old wineskins, he says. If, it, if you put new wine into old wineskins, the wineskins burst, he says, and they are epolumai, they perish. Because there's nothing, you can't use them again. Uh, when they've cracked like that, they, they're just simply discarded. They have no further use for such wineskins. The Lord uses that in connection with the the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and so on. But that's for another time. But the idea when it's applied to ourselves is that as people, unless we repent, Jesus says, we shall perish. What that word conveys is that the judgment of God will one day so come upon us, like this tower falling on the men of Siloam, or like the knife plunging into the heart of the Galilean worshippers. The judgment of God will come upon us one day, and unless we have repented, we shall be useless too. We shall, in other words, be brought up before the judgment seat of God, and God shall look upon us, and he will look upon what? What is it? Well, a man, a woman, like me and like you. And, of course, the big question is, why did God make us? What are we there for? And the shorter catechism will ring in the ears of thousands upon thousands of people at that judgment seat. And the first question and the first answer, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God in his life and to enjoy him forever. And God will look at you and look at me this day. And he'll say, well, is that true of you? I made you to know me. I made you to love me. 
and I made you to serve me, and I made you to worship me. I made you to be in fellowship with me, to know me and to know my son through the bond of the Spirit. And there's none of that in you, you see. None of that. There's a reasonable moral life. There's some acts of kindnesses there. But there's also a fearful neglect of God. There's a disrespect for his word, a disrespect for his sanctuary. There's no prayer. There's no living link between you and him. And when God looks at you, he looks at a shell of a man and a shell of a woman. And however pretty you may have been, however wealthy you may have been, and however much people thought you were admirable, God says, useless, useless. The one thing I made you for is the thing you couldn't be bothered with. Take him away. Take him away. Depart from me, you cursed. Into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? Because we are useless. Spiritually useless. And there is a tremendous sense of tragedy in that. Tragedy. It's not just a loss but a tragic loss that you who were made godlike, and I mean that with the stamp of God on your heart, you who were made to rise so high could be found so low. The one thing God wants in you is just not there. Except you repent, you perish. The key to not perishing is to be useful. The key to being useful is to repent. Except you repent. Repent. The word that's so loaded with negativity, isn't it? Brought that before you several times. But yet it's full of positivity, that word, repent. When you think of repent, you think of people going round with whips and lashes. You see, you, your mind, <clears throat> making these associations, thinks of medieval Catholicism. And you think of uh, penitence and people whipping themselves and uh, repent and so on. This is a vibrant spiritual word, this. Metanoia in the Greek, which means fundamentally afterthought, after thinking. It means change of mind. It means a reorientation, a reorientation of life which begins with a change of mind. It's, it's the Spirit of the Lord bringing the truth to bear upon your heart so that you see things differently. So much so that you turn and you change and you move in a new direction. That's repentance. It's turning from death to life. It's turning from darkness to light. It's a positive thing. And except you repent, you'll perish. But if you repent, you'll discover life in all its fullness and in all its glory. And uh, you see, Paul goes on to say that if you're still there at 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, you'll notice how he says in verse 4, You brethren, you brethren are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, if, if you're Christians, you're always awake to the reality that this is going to come one day. It's going to come, whether in your death or in the actual coming of the Lord, it's going to come. You are all sons of light, he says in verse 5. You belong to the light. You know the light of truth is in you. You're sons of the day. You're not of the night or of the darkness. You don't belong to ignorance and to immorality. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. He's pointing out there what he does in Romans, that very often our worst sins are done under the cover of night. That's, that's when we like to do them. That's when there's an element of shame associated with them. Sad to say, when a society starts to become as decadent as ours is, people don't even need the cover of night anymore. There are some things being done today that would be done 50 years ago in the dark. But people don't feel the need to do them in the dark anymore. They're just not ashamed. When the sense of shame goes, that's, that's a sign of uh, ripeness for the judgment of God. There is no doubt about that. But he says, uh, those who are sleep, asleep, sleep at night, those who get drunk are drunk in the night. But he says, verse 8, we who are of the day, let's be sober. We belong to the day. Um, 
we have a right to expect the day and to wait for the day. So let's put on the breastplate of faith and love and the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but rather to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let that, let that terrible and tragic event be a sign to you not to question where those individuals stood in the light of eternity, because who knows that? But let it be a warning for you to consider where will I be when the sudden catastrophic judgment of God falls upon me and upon everybody? Where will I stand? Always think of it like that. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. I'll pick up on these thoughts, God willing, later tonight too. Let's stand to pray. Our gracious God, we pray that we might all consider well our own preparedness for eternity. We often find it easy to forget the reality of what is to come because there is so much in the world to make us forget it. It is so easy just to be caught up in what happens and in what goes on. And reality is constantly being pushed out by a virtual reality taking its place. Lord, we pray to be real ourselves, to consider well the difference between the day and the night, to remember that there is a day in which the secrets of all men's hearts shall be judged. There is a day coming in which the Lord of glory shall return to this earth which is his, and he will make a cleavage with his sword of truth between the unrighteous and the righteous, between those who knew the Lord and those who did not. Bless these thoughts to us and graciously forgive our sins in the Savior's name. Amen. Our last uh, psalm is Psalm 1b on page 1 to the tune St. Petersburg. Psalm 1b. How blessed the one who does not walk where wicked men would guide his feet, who does not stand in sinners' paths or sit upon the scorner's seat. The law of God is his delight his meditation day and night. He prospers like a tree which has been planted by a flowing stream and in its season yields its fruit. Its leaves are always fresh and green and every act and every word he knows the blessing of the Lord. Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff the wind will blow away. They will not in the judgment stand nor sinners with the righteous stay. God knows the way the righteous go. The wicked's way he'll overthrow. We'll stand to sing the whole psalm to God's praise.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. With a view to the blessing of God and his guidance, then let's turn to the passage we read from Luke chapter 13. And in the morning we looked at verses 3 and 5, which contain the same message, where Christ tells us that unless we repent, we will all similarly perish. That's in a way similar to the people who had died when the Tower of Siloam fell. And it's in connection with these words that Jesus goes on in verse 6 to give us the parable. And I want us to read the parable again together. Verse 6, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit in it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit in this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, leave it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bears fruit well, But if not, after that, you can cut it down. And this, uh, perhaps, especially the words in verse 8, where the plea goes up to leave it alone this year also. Leave it alone for this year also. Now, we're returning tonight, as you can see, to the passage that we were looking at in the morning. And you'll remember, as I said before the reading, that the theme of the whole narrative here is the judgment of God. Christ is speaking about God's judgment. And in connection with God's judgment, people take an opportunity to ask him questions regarding the two recent local tragedies that have taken place in Jerusalem. We saw in the morning in some detail what these were. There was, first of all, a tragedy involving human evil when Pilate, the governor of Judea, organized that some leading men from Galilee be effectively assassinated as they were worshiping in the temple. A terrible thing, worshipers knifed to death, and it caused a lot of disquiet and concern amongst the people. The other incident wasn't an incident of human evil, but what we would just call an accident, an unfortunate event, when a tower in Siloam fell and 18 people were killed. I mean, just uh, not that long ago, a few days ago, one of the stadia they were building in Brazil collapsed and killed workers working there. And, of course, we've had the terrible catastrophe here on Friday evening when the helicopter plunged into the building and several people have died. So it's that kind of incident. And of course, these things grip people's minds. The more local they are, the more they grip people's minds. And they wonder especially what God means, either by commanding it, permitting it, or what kind of message might be in it uh, for the people who see it and who witness it. And I did mention in the morning that sometimes the people who expect God to intervene in these situations are people who don't want God to intervene in any other part of their lives. It was famously asked in America after the last school shooting, where was God? 
And a very perceptive spiritual person answered, well, you don't want God in your schools anyway, so why do you want this intervention now? It was a good point, an important point. And people can ask that kind of question very flippantly and foolishly, where was God? But the question is asked here seriously, and Christ answers it appropriately, seriously as well. And his response is twofold. You'll remember that his first response was essentially just this, that you cannot argue from an event, uh, an event of this kind, a catastrophe of this kind. You cannot argue from that to the sinfulness of the people who perish in it. In other words, you can't always say that such an event is the judgment of God. Now, sometimes God can make plain that it is his judgment, but by no means can you always assume that it is. So you should never do that. We saw that in detail. I want to leave it there. The second thing Christ says is that events of this kind, catastrophes, accidents, should make us always think of the judgment of God, the judgment of God upon ourselves. Except you repent, Jesus says, you will all likewise perish. In other words, a sudden catastrophic judgment from God will fall upon us all one day unless we repent. So instead of analyzing the spiritual conditions of those who fell, we should rather learn a lesson very much for ourselves. And in that sense, the, the act of God which causes the tower to fall is an act that is designed by God to produce, us, uh, to produce repentance in us. It is designed to move us to repent by thinking of the brevity of life and, and so on. So it's a call to repentance. And it's in that connection that Christ goes on to give us this parable here, the parable of the fig tree in the vineyard. It's the same narrative. It's the same essential teaching. But I want to look with you at the fig tree as God brings it before us, and let's hear what God is saying to us in it. And there are four things that I want us to look at in connection with this fig tree, simple things, where it was, what it was like, what was done to it, and what happened to it. So these are, I hope, fairly easy things to remember, where it was, what it was like, what was done to it, and what happened to it. We'll begin with where it was. Notice, this man planted a fig tree in his vineyard. Now, normally, what you plant in a vineyard is a vine. But here is a fig tree planted there. It's planted there because a vineyard always contains the best soil. And that's really the point here. The point is that this ordinary fig tree is put in the place where it is most likely to be productive. It's given the best place or the best opportunity to grow. And that's the message, very simple message. And what that clearly represents is a person or a people being put in situations where they have the best opportunity to bring forth spiritual fruit to the glory of God. In other words, they are surrounded, people like you and people like me, they are surrounded by God with favorable spiritual privileges. A religious soil, if you like, a spiritual soil and a spiritual climate which is most likely to make you productive, fruitful in the service of God. Now, there's no doubt on the basis of Scripture that God will judge us all according to the light that we have received and according to the number of privileges that we have enjoyed. That lesson is taught time and time again in the Bible. There's no doubt about it. We are not all judged um, in the same way in that respect. I mean, there's no respect of persons with God. At the end of the day, it's the same standard by which we are judged, the standard of holiness. But God bears in mind the different situations that we have. After all, Christ tells us very plainly that to whom much is given, of him much shall be required. 
No, it's as simple as that. That's essentially telling you that if God does a lot for you, if God surrounds you with his goodness and his grace and his kindness and his privileges, then God has a right, as it were, to expect much from you. He gave you much, and so he has a right to expect much in return. And although it is the truth, the solemn truth of the Bible, that all of us are dead in trespasses and sins, and all of us are under the wrath and the curse of God, whose law we have broken, and all of us are liable because of that to the pains of hell, the miseries of this life and the pains of hell. Although that is so, yet we are not liable to it to the same degree. It doesn't mean at all necessarily that your hell would be the same as mine. God forbid that we go there. But it doesn't mean that yours would be the same as mine. In fact, the chapter immediately before this teaches exactly that. If you look at chapter 12 here, just go back a few verses to chapter 12 and verse 47. We're introduced here to two servants who are supposed to do their master's will. But this servant in verse 47, who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, he did not know it in as much detail or as much fullness, yet committed the things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For, he says, everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So there it's very, very plain. I mean, it's elsewhere in the Scripture too. We're judged according to privilege. Not everyone's heaven will be exactly the same, and neither will everyone's hell be exactly the same. There is no such thing as an easygoing punishment in hell. A lost eternity is never a pleasant thing, but yet it remains true that for some it is worse than others, according to what we did with the privileges that we received. Now, by telling us in this parable that the fig tree is planted in the vineyard, God is drawing your attention to a people, or an individual maybe, you or me, placed in a very favorable spiritual condition. Now, the first application here is definitely, or at least I'm pretty sure, it is to the Jewish people to the church under the old covenant. As Paul reminds us, they were blessed with the oracles of God. They received the priesthood, a fullness of ministry, a clarity of revelation, a tabernacle, a temple, the voice of God, and a Shekinah glory. To them were sent, first of all, the prophets, the holy men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They got all that. They didn't get it for themselves, alone, exclusively. They were meant to be light bearers to others. They were meant to be missionaries with what they had received and to shine the light to a Gentile world. Now, they ceased to do that, and it's not our business to go into why they ceased to do it right now, but they did cease to do it. But God gave them that, and he gave it to them first. And even the sign of circumcision upon them as children was a sign that they were favored and they were blessed. They were the firstborn, and to them belonged these things in a way that they didn't belong to others. It's as though they were born with a kind of right and entitlement. God favored them with that. God gave them all these things. And I'm quite sure when Christ says here, These three years, he says in verse 7, you'll notice that, these three years I have come seeking fruit in the fig tree. I'm quite sure that that is a reference really to himself and his own ministry amongst the Jews, which lasted at this point about three years. In other words, he's saying to the Jewish people here, you have been favored, you have been planted as unworthy fig trees in a rich fertile soil. And for these three years, 
I have sought fruit in your lives. So there's the first application to the Jewish people. But still, I want us to remember, and it's important to remember, that there's a division still. There are still some people more privileged than others. And it's not now the Jewish people with the rest of us as Gentiles. That day has gone. It's past. It's finished. The people who are most privileged today are the churched. They have a head start compared to the unchurched, or if you like, the baptized, compared to those who have not been baptized. Now, I know that your baptism, perhaps, uh, it may be something that you think of as very formal. It may have, may have been done very formally. It may have been done um, culturally, almost as a custom. And in a way, that's neither here nor there. I want you to think about baptism really and spiritually, its significance. And for most of you here tonight, it means that you were born into the visible church of Christ, for most of you. I mean, there are some of you here tonight, and you were not born into the church of Christ. You knew perhaps nothing of the gospel. You knew nothing about Christianity for years. That's true, but, and praise God that you have come to hear of it. it. It's been his purpose, it was his will from eternity that you come to hear and that you hear the good news of the gospel and you be blessed with it, be thankful for that. But there are many of you here who have not come to faith in Christ, but you were born within the bosom of his church. You were raised sucking the milk of his own word. There were some of you here who were born of good Christian parents. And you were raised to know the truth. And you had good Sabbath school teachers. And you had faithful elders. And you had faithful ministers. Some of you were even brought up in a community in which these things were honored and respected and reverenced. You had all that. You still have all that. It is true of you today that all that was yours. Like Paul said to Timothy, from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. How many of you can say that just now? Yes, from childhood I have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make me wise to salvation. If you can say that, and if you can follow all I've been saying, you're in the vineyard too. And you'll notice, by the way, that you are planted in it. A certain man planted a fig tree in his vineyard. Planted. Are you there by accident? Is it just the case that you happen to be born with all these privileges? No. It's not by accident, but by design. It was God's purpose to raise you there. It was God's purpose to teach you these things and to give you these spiritual privileges. God gave you a start. He gave you a head start, a spiritual head start. Now, you can say, well, I never asked for it. That doesn't matter. He gave it to you. It's a good thing to have. Whether you value it or not, it's a great thing to have. Think of it. Think of it. He planted you in his vineyard. How many of you can say, yes, yes, he did just that. So second, what is the fig tree like? We've seen where it was. What is the fig tree like? Well, before we see what it's like, I think we should first of all ask what it should be like. Assuming it's in season, what should the fig tree be like? Well, the simple answer is full of figs. If it's in the best soil, if it's at the right time, it should be drawing from the nutritious soil around it, sucking all that goodness and moisture up from the roots, growing strong internally, and bringing forth fruit to the glory of God. These things obviously represent you, or me, nurtured in the bosom of Christ's church, surrounded by the word of God and all our spiritual privileges, and using them. In what way? Well, using them to bring forth faith and repentance, turning to God, and by love starting to produce figs. 
the wine to change the figure. Let's suppose for a moment you're a vine and not a fig tree. The fruit of the Spirit, the wine that God expects in his kingdom, which is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, self-control, goodness. Do you know these things? Are they in your life? Are these spiritual qualities in your life? I mean, I ask you, do you know them? Do you pray? Do you communicate with God? Do you speak with him? to see speak with you? Is the Bible an open book? Is it yielding its secrets? Is it bringing the balm of God's comfort and consolation to your soul? Does it bring in a living way his rebuke? Does it lift up your countenance? Does it convict you of sin? Does it show you Christ and him crucified? Does it bring you a remedy for your sin? Do you repent? Do you love? Do you believe? Are you able to bear with injury? Do you know meekness? Do you know gentleness? Do you know these things? Do you know them? Do you have them in your life? That's what God expects. That's what you should be. When God planted you near his word and near his people in the midst of his church, it wasn't to sit there, a dry, barren tree, but to bring forth fruit to his glory. But what's the fig tree actually like? Well, two things about it. The first, very obviously, is that it's fruitless. These three years... I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, verse 7, and I find none. None. At least nothing that we can call real fruit and real figs. Not even something that's ripening. Just nothing. I'm sure some of you will know, if you know your Bibles very well, you'll remember another occasion on which Jesus went to a fig tree. Well, this, he doesn't go, he's only using a fig tree in a parable here. But you'll remember an occasion when he actually went up physically to a fig tree. And this fig tree was full of leaves. And we're told, in St. Matthew 21, we're told that Jesus looked on the fig tree to find figs. And underneath the leaves, he found nothing. And then he did something that is very unusual. In fact, something that is unique in the scriptures. He pronounced a curse, pronounced a curse on that fig tree. It's the only destructive miracle Christ ever produced. All his miracles were constructive. They were wholesome. They were healing, doing good. But here, once, noticeably, uniquely, so that we would notice it, he destroys It is a destructive miracle. Let no fruit grow on you, he says, henceforth and forevermore. And the following day, when the disciples walked past the scene of the pronunciation of the curse on the fig tree, already it had begun to wither away. Why did he wither it? Why did he reduce to a dry, barren stump something that a few moments before had been luxurious in its foliage and its bright green appearance? Well, precisely because it claimed to be something it wasn't. Normally, when a fig tree appeared like that, it ought to have fruit underneath its leaves. And when it didn't have that fruit, Christ presented it as an illustration of a proud and pompous Pharisee. A person that appeared to be alive and appeared to be in a relationship with God. But when you went under the veneer and what was on the outside, there was nothing there. There was no reality. There was pomp and ceremony. But there was no love and joy, no faith, no repentance, no prayer. Yes, there was an external prayer in the synagogue. There was a long-winded prayer to impress the hearers, to impress the widows. But there was no life, no life. And the curse was pronounced 
because there was no life. Is there no life? Remain lifeless from now on and forevermore. And that's the condition with this fig tree. For three years I've come, he says, and there's no fruit there. I'll come to the visitation in a minute, but is it true of yourself that all these years you've been in the vineyard and still no fruit? How patient God is. His patience is remarkable. He is not all suffering, but he is long suffering, and he does forbear. And for years and years, he looks and he examines and he searches for fruit. And how sad it is if he can still say of you tonight that I'm finding nothing there. Nothing there. I find nothing there. Is that you? God finds nothing. Nothing. But it's not just a fruitless fig tree. We're told, tragically, that it also cumbers the ground or exhausts the ground. At the end of verse 7, you see the command comes, cut it down. Why does it use up the ground or why does it exhaust the ground? Now, why does he say that? Well, I think this conveys two thoughts, not just one. I think it's designed to convey two thoughts. The first is this, that this fig tree is using the resources of the vineyard unprofitably. It's sucking up what's good, but it's not turning it into anything valuable or fruitful to God. It is, in effect, in that way, just wasting space, taking up space that some other fig tree could take up. It's casting a shade that is hindering someone else from being productive. It's taking God's goodness and using it on itself. Just like we do in lots of different ways all the time. I mentioned in the morning, you see, when people say, well, where was God and why didn't he intervene and so on and so on. Um, by nature, we are good at blaming God when it all goes pear-shaped and at refusing to thank him when all goes well. You see, when we have a bad day, it's all God's fault. But when we have a good day, well, aren't we doing well? And you see, the tragic events, even of Friday, well, why does God allow that? But isn't mankind good at rallying to the cause? And isn't mankind good at providing food? And isn't mankind good at keeping people warm and rescuing those who have been harmed? Yes, let God be responsible for the bad bits and the nasty bits. But let man take the credit and the praise and the glory for everything that is good, you see. That's the way it goes. And that's the way it is in life. God sends the rain, we're told, on the just and the unjust. Yes, he sends it on us as sinners, just like he sent it on Noah, and just like he sent it on Job, and righteous men and women, he sends it on us. And what do we do with it, huh? What do we do with it? Like the rich man who had a massive harvest, and he said, well, my crops have brought forth abundantly. Luke chapter 12. What will I do with them? I'll build bigger rooms where I can really store up my harvest. And I can take it easy. And I can relax. I can retire early. And God showers so much on you. Showers it on you. I mean, look at the world. Look at the Philippines. Look at what's happened. And here you are, and you're, I'm no different from you, and you've got plenty clothes in your wardrobes, and plenty food in your cupboards, and your freezers are full, and your bank accounts are more healthy than you think they are, and you have houses, and they're warm. Supposing your central heating would collapse for a day, we would think Armageddon had arrived. And what do we do with the whole thing? Do we rise up in the morning and praise God for it all? Do we fall down on our knees at night and say, Lord, I am undeserving of the least of your mercy? No, that's not what you do. You just take it all. I don't mean to be unkind, but I speak in God's name, friend. And it's my duty to speak in God's name. And 
just to say to you that that is maybe what you do. You just take, 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 take. And you give God nothing back. I'm not talking about putting a collection in his plate. I'm talking about things like love and joy and repentance and believing. Mercy and faith and loving kindness. And they're just not there. There's no hunger and thirst for him. There's no knowledge of him. There's no desire to please God. They're just not there, you see, because you take and you don't give. And all these years in the vineyard, and you're as dry as this fig tree and as fruitless and as cursed as this fig tree. Unless you change, unless you repent. There's a verse in Romans 2 which tells us that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. It's a beautiful verse, that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. If you really want to get right to the heart of the meaning of it, the particular way it's written in the Greek can be translated like this, that the goodness of God is designed to lead you to repentance. Not, not just that it does, because sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, but the goodness of God is designed to lead you to repentance. In other words, when God shows you good, and when he shows you kindness and favor in the sense of giving you things, it's all designed to make you turn to be thankful in your heart and to glorify him and to embrace him as he's offered in his Savior. That's, that's what it's all there for, to make you turn, to lead you to repentance. Instead of that, it hardens your heart and you just take and you don't give back. But it's not just the idea, you see, of using the good things of God unprofitably. That's not all we have here. This idea of using up the ground or cumbering the ground actually carries the idea of hindering others. I hinted at that a moment ago, that a bad fig tree is just polluting the space where others could be and taking something out of the ground that others could use up. Have you ever thought that somehow you might be taking away what others could have? That you may be making other people's life situation worse. Have you ever thought of that? You think, no, there's no way I have a harmful influence on anybody else. And you may say, I don't care what you say. I don't. I just don't. My, my life has a good influence. My life is a good influence. I, there's no one who can come into contact with me and say, well, I'm a bad influence because I'm a good influence. Are you sure? Are you sure about that? You're sure tonight that your life is a good influence on other people. Um, I mentioned in the morning what Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all perish, and how the word perish carries the idea of being useless. It's a sad thing to think that our life may be spiritually useless or even spiritually destructive. Were the Pharisees not like that? And the lawyers... Jesus said to the lawyers, the ecclesiastical lawyers, and boy, they can be some kind of lawyers. Christ said to these lawyers, he said, you take away the key of knowledge from the people. And not only do you not enter the kingdom of heaven itself, but you lock it against others so that they can't get in either. There you have it, you see. People who thought themselves blessed, and not only were they out of the kingdom, but they were shutting the door on other people as well. Their ecclesiastical cousins, the Pharisees, were exactly the same. Jesus said to them, you cross land and sea. Oh, the seal, the seal and the earnestness. You cross land and sea to make a proselyte to your own cause, to convert someone to Phariseeism. And, he says, you make them twofold more the children of hell than you are yourselves. You'll discover that when someone is zealously proselyted into a cause, they become more zealous than the people who actually did the proselytizing in the first place. Christ says, you're like that, he says. Not only are you not entering, but you're making matters worse for them. Now, I don't know about you, but for myself, it's one thing to think that I'm keeping myself out of the kingdom of heaven. But it's terribly, terribly awful and depressing to think that I might be keeping somebody else out of the kingdom of heaven. It's one thing for you to go up to the judgment seat of God, is it not? And to hear God say, you have not entered into the kingdom. But what will it mean for you? And what does it mean for you eternally? 
What, do, what are the consequences for you eternally if God can also turn to you and say, by the way, you also kept another person out, and you kept that person out. You stopped that person coming in, and you say, well, Lord, how did I do that? And he just begins to pick up the things in your life that were a negative and bad witness. You were raised in the church, but you did it down. You just spoke against it all the time. You never actually walked in the ways of the faithful forefathers, but you chose a laxer way and a looser way. You adopted habits and practices that are really inconsistent with a thoroughgoing Christian profession, and just by doing them, you advocated them. And you maybe gave off the impression that you were safe and secure because you belonged to the church, maybe even a church with a particular name. You gave the impression that because you belonged to it, you were all right. And you spawned descendants who believed exactly the same thing. That because they had the right label, the right ecclesiastical label, they were bound for heaven. And they all went to their graves clutching such a pathetic lie in their right hand. And it's your fault. Maybe your fault. It's easily done. We can show an example of careless living. That leads someone else to destruction. Can you do that today? Can you think about it? Or can you honestly say to me, look, my life just points people in a good direction. Are you sure? Are you sure your life points people in a good direction? This fig tree, in the last analysis, wasn't just fruitless. It was harmful. It was a waste of space. And it was taking away light and nutrients from others who would actually benefit from it. Or oh, will our children look at us and say, yes, yes, you left us a good heritage and a good example? Will they say that? Are you concerned that they say that? Third, what's done to this fig tree? Well, God visits it. Let's take that in two parts. There's, first of all, an examination. These three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree. There's a sense, in, of course, in which this examination is ongoing. You see, God examines us all the time. We know fine well that um, God knows us all the time. But there are ways in which God lets us know that he is examining us, that he's watching us, and that he's ass- assessing us. And really, the examination I'm talking about happens when God lets you know that he knows you. When God lets you know that he knows you. In other words, he makes you conscious that he's examining you. Conscious that he's assessing you in the scales or in the balance of his own judgment. And when he does, like the church in Laodicea, you will see yourself miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But it's good when God shows you that. You know, we we thought of that in connection with Laodicea, and it was was a terrible message to hear. It's terrible for us to discover that that's the truth about ourselves, but nothing is ever built in God's kingdom without being raised to the ground. I mean, when it comes to us, God has to deconstruct us before he constructs us. He has to do something with us. He has to show us ourselves that we have to see that. We've got to face reality, friends, all the time. I was speaking about that this morning, our proneness to live in a virtual reality and our great need to see things as they really, really are. And when God comes to this fig tree examining it, um, it's a good thing when he comes and shows you what exactly you are and what exactly you deserve. It's as though when that happens, you hear a voice saying, cut it down, why should it cumber the ground anymore? That kind of thing can happen sometimes when you're listening to a sermon like this or when you're reading the Word of God, and it can come to you and you say, well, yes, I feel it. It's in my gut. It's in my head. It's in my heart that God knows me now and he sees me and he's not happy with me. I'm not right with God. I ought to be right with God because I've been planted in a vineyard and he took care to plant me there. 
but I've done nothing but abuse it and squander it all my days, whether I'm 16, 26, 40, 50, 80. You've done nothing but squander it. God lets you know. He examines you through the word of God which goes into you sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit and discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the falsity is stripped away. You know yourself at last, and you see yourself at last for what and who you are. Is that not a good thing? Wretched man that I am. Have you seen yourself like that? Wretched man, wretched woman, fruitless, godless, hopeless. You need to. You need to. You know, people sometimes say, how, how bad do I need to see myself? How, how badly do I need to feel it? Forget how badly you need to feel it. <laughs> if you see it clearly enough and feel it enough to enable you tonight to turn to Jesus Christ, you've seen it enough and you've felt it enough. Don't bother counting your tears Don't bother wondering if you've agonized about your situation as deeply as someone else has. If you felt it enough to move, you felt it enough. If you've seen it clearly enough to believe in Christ and follow him, you've seen it clearly enough. And enough's enough when you move, and until you move, it's not enough. What is it that hinders you? God has examined you. He's, a, he's showing you yourself. He's a, you're fruitless. I'm finding nothing. Well, what is it that you do about it? But you see, um, the visitation here isn't just an examination. It's a direct intervention. You'll notice that. Because this coming to see is actually followed up by an intervention. You know, there's a cry from heaven which says, cut it down. <laughs> You know, there's a sense in which you should think of that cry going on all the time. All the time. People talk about a right to life when they speak about the unborn or or about whatever or or the elderly, a right to life. Okay, it, it depends by what standard. I mean, who has a right to life? Do you have a right to life? I'll tell you what you have a right to, friend. Death. You've got a right to that. An inalienable right, as the American Constitution might say, to die. You have that. That's the only right we've got as sinners. We are under the wrath and curse of God, and any life we have is by God's sufferance and by God's toleration. Do we understand that? No, we don't. No, we don't. Because we're conditioned by year after year of humanism and rationalistic principles. And we're all there. We've all been sold that, and to some extent we've all swallowed it, and we talk this nonsense, this guff about our rights. We have no right to life. We have a right to die. That's all. That's all. And every single day, in essence, there's a voice saying, cut that man down. Cut that woman down. There's nothing there. Why should they live? And you know, it's a mystery to me. Why should we live when we're nothing but dead men walking and fruitless and spiritless and godless and loveless? Why should we live? But this intervention comes up and says, stop. Leave it. Leave him. Leave her. One more year while I dig around this fig tree and while I fertilize it. After that, If it's not fruitful, cut it down. But if it produces fruit then, isn't that good? Isn't that good? Dig around it and fertilize it. You know what that is in real life. It's just giving the tree every chance. Just cutting holes around it, giving it space to breathe, putting manure on it, just effort after effort. As God said in Isaiah chapter 5, what more could I do than, than I've done with this vineyard? And God does it for you. What, what is the digging and what's the fertilizing? It's just the providential shaking that God sometimes gives us. Things that he's giving you, shaking you, bringing things into your life. 
And the, the idea behind it is to call you to repentance. That's what it's all doing. Like, like this tragedy here in Glasgow, like the two tragedies here in Luke chapter 13, Christ is essentially saying, look, the fall of the tower in Siloam is a call to repentance to you. He says, do you not understand that? It's a reminder of judgment. Forget the spiritual condition of the people. It's a reminder of judgment and a call to repent. And that's what that helicopter crashing through the roof on that pub all of a sudden taking souls into eternity. That's what it is to you. That's what it is to you. It's a call to repent. It's a call to believe and a call to be fruitful. And God's doing that for you, shaking you. Do you feel it? Do you, can you look at things in your life just now and saying things are going hard, things are going difficult? That's God shaking. That's God calling. And he's shaking you hard, saying, listen, listen. Use your privilege Use your God-given privileges. Use them well now because you've got one more year. In the case of this fig tree, it was one more year. You know, I preached this sermon in my last congregation, strangely enough, at the beginning of a year in a January. And I'm preaching it now at the close of a year in a December. I mean, who knows but that God said this about you at the beginning of the year. Give one more year. Certainly there were people where I preached it last who aren't here anymore. They've gone. They've gone. And God may be saying of you, give him one more year. Give her one more year. I don't know. All I know is that you haven't got an infinite amount of space. That's all I know. None of our lives are very long. And some of these lives cut off in Glasgow were painfully painfully short a little more time and that's all you've got that's all you've got last of all what happened to the fig tree we don't know we don't know this is one of these things like other parables in the bible that are just left hanging it's as though you want to say well well what happened to the fig tree Finish the story. It's like the parable of the prodigal son, isn't it? Where the father expostulates with the older brother and he says, All that I have is yours. You're meant to enjoy it and be happy with it. Come in. Come into the feasting. Come into the merriment. Come in with your younger brother who was lost and is now found. And then it's left hanging, you see. And we don't know what happened. Why is it left hanging? Well, he means it to be left hanging because he's essentially saying to them, what are you going to do? You Pharisees, will you come into the house of my father and feast with me and rejoice with me? Or will you stay outside? And here is Christ not essentially saying to the Jews first, I've come to you and I'm examining you and I'm giving you space and what is your response? Well, we know the answer to that tragically. After Christ died... The gospel was preached. And who was it first offered to? To the people who were most instrumental in killing him. And for 40 years, that gospel was preached in Jerusalem. For 40 years. And they still didn't accept it. And then the curtain fell. The Roman armies invaded. The temple is raised to the ground. And they are scattered to the four winds. 40 years they got and you? Well, I don't know. I know that there's a voice in heaven all the time, Bridget Mar saying, why should it be spared? There's another voice saying, leave it. And as long as you're here, I mean, the fact that you're here tonight hearing this is a sign that you're being dug around and fertilized. The preaching of this sermon is a digging around your roots, and it's a fertilizing. And for any favor, take that seriously. Take it seriously. God is speaking to you. He's speaking to your soul, young man, young woman, calling you into his kingdom because you don't know how long you've got. There's no time to waste. Now is the day of salvation. Let us pray. Our gracious God of mercy and grace, 
when in your kindness you show us goodness, and when you go further and dig around and fertilize, O Lord, may it be that we begin to produce fruit. What does the Lord require of us but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly without God, and to turn to you through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the stairway to heaven? We pray that not another day would pass with a fruitless life. And may the first fruit be seen even tonight in an earnest prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner, and lead me from here to glory. In the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. Let's close by singing Psalm 37 on page 255. We're singing to the tune Spore. It's verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and the exalt shall he the earth to inherit. When cut off the wicked, thou shalt see. I saw the wicked great in power spread like a green bay tree. He passed, yea, was not. Him I sought, but found he could not be. So he's been cut off in spite of his pretensions. But mark thou the perfect, that's the upright man. Behold the man of uprightness, because that surely of this man the latter end is peace. But those men that transgressors are shall be destroyed together. The latter end of wicked men shall be cut off forever. We'll sing these uh, four stanzas, verse 34 to 38, standing to sing to the praise of God. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen.